Okay, so it's quarter two, so I think we'll make a start. Hello and welcome back uh, to the fourth session of today's LFS and APS um, con user conference. Um, you are in session 4A, um, just in case, um, I just wanted to check that you're in the right session for the presentations you wanted to join this afternoon. Um, if you wanted to join session 4B, then the link for that is, is in the chat. Um, so I've got the pleasure of introducing uh, two presentations in this session today. Our first one up is uh, from David Owen uh, from the University of Warwick. Um, David is a, a principal research fellow at the Institute of Employment Research and a geographer. And his research interests are in using uh, large quantitative data sources such as the LFS and census um, to explore labour market differences between socioeconomic and ethnic groups. And his talk today is about the armed forces veterans in the UK labour market. So thank you very much, David. And if you're ready, I can hand over to you. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Martina. Uh, I'll just try sharing my screen now. Um, oh. Yes, that seems to be working. Yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Okay, right. Thank you. Sorry, a bit misleading on my screen. Uh, okay, yes. Um, yes, thank you. As uh, as, as said, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, data on the armed forces veterans in the UK labour market. And this is drawing upon data from the annual population survey accessed by the Secure Data uh, ONS Secure Research Service. Um, it's the work is undertaken as part of a research project funded by the Forces in Mind Trust, uh, which is uh, an armed forces charity looking into longer term outcomes of employment for. Um, uh, but um, for veterans, uh, ex for ex force, ex UK forces, the veterans uh, in in the UK, um, the um, this part of the research uh, re refers to the quantitative part of the uh, project. Most of the research is was undertaken due with uh, through interviews uh, as an online survey kind of qualitative semi-structured interviews and focus groups uh, because there isn't a lot of quantitative data on armed forces veterans. This is um, despite the fact that armed, the veterans are, have been of high profile recently following two uh, long uh, major armed conflicts in the in the, the in the, the Middle East and Afghanistan and the uh, in the Iraq and the other conflicts, um, and the um, the government has made commitments in the UK government and the Scottish government has made commitments to the of the uh, veterans to their fair treatment and to help them into employment, uh, um, but. One of the problems with this is that in order to make such commitments, you need data to monitor the the lives of the, the careers of veterans. And this is something which is lacking. The career transition, when people leave the services, they invited to contact the, the career transition partnership who guides them into civilian employment. So career transition partnership gathers data on the, the um, initial part of the, the initial move into civilian employment. And this shows that um, veterans have a very high rate of economic activity and employment initially. Um, that, so after back the six, they, they collect data uh, uh, up to six months after leaving the forces and show that veterans are 90% are economically active at that point, and 84% are in are in employment at that point six months later. The um, annual population survey, as far as I can tell, is the only major UK survey which contains and has, contains a question on veterans. But this is was only present in the survey between 
2014 and 29, the January, December 2014 and January, December 2018. And it was funded, this, quest, this was uh, funded by the Ministry of Defence. It's the most, but this is the, um, the most recent source of data on by veterans. Um, the, the, we got to go through set, percent a series of uh, descriptive tables and charts which contrast labour market participation by type of veteran and and the, the, the occupational industrial employment patterns. Um, looking at the, the demographic variations between veterans. Um, and I'm also going to cover, look at the deficiencies of labour market data for veterans. Um, so what sources of data exist from which veteran employment can be monitored? Well, the most regular, regular source of employment data in the UK and the GB and Great Britain are the Business Register and Employment Survey, Business Count, UK Business Count, Annual Survey and Hours and Earnings. None of these record veteran status. Not the, the most, the Labour Force Survey and Annual Population Survey, the main sources of regular data on the demographic characteristics of people work in the, in the workforce. Um, Unfortunately, the none of the data is no data from the LFS and APS include data on none of the published data or end user license data from the LFS and APS include data on veterans. Understanding society is the main source of longitudinal data. It too does not include a veteran question. Veterans can potentially be identified using data from the secure version of the APS um, using and, and the LFS by using the most detailed versions of the previous industry and occupation, identify, identifying those people who, who had previously worked in the armed forces and in armed forces occupations and tracing them um, um in in you know through the waves um or in using the questions on uh occupation the one year ago or in the last occupation but the, this is um uh, very dif difficult because of the small number small sample sizes sizes um the other sources of possible sources of data are census of the population um it does the pre, pre previous censuses have asked, asked data asked about uh current uh uh employment or current currently those currently serving in the armed forces these can that, that question can be used in the um longitudinal study to trace the uh, subsequent employment and labour market history of of people who were serving in the forces and some data is available from commission ad hoc commission questions which show that um the that uh, that there is uh, uh, some of the same patterns which will be revealed later on in this paper um the service, uh, the service leaders data base, can, which collects data on all personnel have left the UK armed forces, has been linked with the 2011 census of population, and this has shown that um, the um, that veterans have a very high economic activity and uh, employment rates in 2011, confirming the. Um, so it's CTP statistics, but the, the problem is that um, there's no source of more recent data, no source of regular data. The annual population survey included um, the questions on veteran status uh, because in between 2014 and 2018, because the Ministry of Defence funded the, the series of questions which were used to, to produce a report on 
and veterans uh, youth, uh, until up to 2018, um, which um, is, has been withdrawn at the moment. Um, can you, just one second, I've to. I'm sorry, somebody at the door. <clears throat> no, very sorry, very sorry. No um, problem. <laughs> Um, yes, these are the questions which are in the annual population survey. Veterans status, best served, which have ever served in, the, in a branch of the armed forces, which branch are you currently in the armed forces or in the reserves? And then a question which measures, uh, records the, um, the year in which a person left the armed forces. Um, in this analysis, I'm focusing now, the um, Ministry of Defence report was focusing on the whole veteran, the series of annual Ministry of Defence reports do produce employment data, do produce data on the, on the characteristics of the veteran population, but the, they, they come from the health branch of the MOD and their focus, and their focus is on the whole veteran population. The, the whole veteran population is elderly and they... Um, the and the, there are over two million veterans, most of whom are over age, over retirement age, and um, clearly then the in terms of welfare, the the needs are more uh, towards health directed to all health rather than towards employment. This the the, the difference of this paper as uh, uh, looking at the research project looking at employment history, uh, experience, long-term employment experience of veterans, we are therefore focusing on veterans age 18 to uh, 64, uh, assuming that very few veterans would be aged under 18. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, that, that, that population is about three quarters of a million over the, and this, this as I uh, say, this uh, is th over the period 2016 to 2018. The tables and figures presented here use the three year um, APS for 2016 to 18 in order to get large enough sample sizes to analyze um, rather than looking at the annual APS. The, um, so there are about 13,000 people leave the forces every quarter at the moment over the period 2016 to 18. Um, and there's about some of them, uh, three and quarters of a million veterans in the population. Within that population, the, the chart shows that the veteran population is, is skewed towards the older age groups, uh, which over half are being aged over 50, numbers declining in successively younger age groups. Most veterans tend to leave in their 30s and 40s. About uh, an eighth of veterans, 13.3%, are female, reflecting the gender breakdown of the forces as a whole. Female veterans tend to be younger than, uh, than uh, male veterans. Geographical distribution of veterans. Um, veterans represent just under two percent of all people aged 18, 18 to sixty-four living in Great Britain. Um, the largest number of veterans live in the south, the west, southeast, and southwest of England. But the veteran share of the population is highest in the southwest and smallest by far in London. Uh, London's it's it's. Um, the, these numbers tend to reflect the the pattern the pattern in 2011 from the 2011 census, which was uh, data which was linked with the service leaders database. So there's not there's no real change in geographical distribution over that period. Overall economic activity, so veterans. 82% of veterans 
were economic active in 2011. In 2016 to 18, 83.2% were vet were, were economically active. So more or less, again, more or less stability over the period. The percentage economically active was high, was is high. The the over 90% uh like in the right hand uh, axis of this chart. For, for most age groups in, in the prime economic active age, the younger age group is lower age group, uh, lower percentage of economic active because um, of participation education. But then when you reach over 50 economic and uh, uh, ne more nearer to retirement age, um, the economic activity falls off quite sharply. The unemployment rates are, are low, 3.3 percent of the highest for those aged 18 to 80, uh, 18 to 24. The economic inactivity rate increases with age and uh, nearer the nearer a veteran is to uh, you know official retirement age, the higher the economic the higher economic activity rates. Um, there are differential by uh, gender in, uh, in terms in terms of employment rates. Uh, men are more likely to be are markedly more likely to be employed than women. The employment rate for men increased between eighteen twenty four and twenty five to twenty nine year age groups, and remained about ninety percent until the. 40 to 45 year age group, afterwards falling sharply. Women's employment rate, uh, small numbers mean that 100% uh, for the youngest age group, um, uh, then fall uh, uh, until, and then rise again in the 40s, in, for, for female veterans in, the 40s, in their 40s. The male, female, male, male, female differential was widest for veterans in the 30s and in the, the 60s. Um, for the employment rate for women falling off more quickly than that for men, probably reflecting a higher, the short, low, or the younger, a younger rate, the uh, average rate of age of retirement. Um, women were more likely to be employed than men. If, although in the 45 to 49 year old age group. Um, educational, highest educational qualifications has a high, has a very high, uh, strong impact on economic activity. Um, as you can see here, the economic activity rate declines as the highest educational qualification declines. Um, so, from 90% for those with degree of equivalence qualifications down to around 60% for those with no qualifications. Um, the, uh, as a concomitant, the, econom the, the economic inactivity rate increases as the highest level of, uh, of, of educational qualification falls. Most, most most markedly between those between uh, GCSE and uh, other qualifications, those in no qualifications. Again, the, the unemployment rate is also highest for those with the poorest educational qualifications. The employment rates, um, again, show a very stark um, contrast between uh, by, by educational qualification and also the the gradient in terms of employment rates is, is steeper for women than for men in, in terms of as the highest level of highest educational qualification declines. Um, so the, the, the differential in employment rates between men and women is highest for those with the the poorest educational qualifications. 
Um, in, in terms of regional variations, employment rates are highest for veterans, the highest in southeast and in, eastern England and London, are the lowest employment rates in Wales and Scotland. The economic activity rate shows a less clear pattern, but it's a, is was highest highest in London, where the the veteran population is smallest, um, um, and also in the neighbouring areas of the parts of the southeast, there's not a lot less variation between regions outside, other than this southeastern corner of Britain. So, relative to the rest of Britain, uh, contrast. Economic inactivity was lower in the south, also lower in the south and east of England than in the rest of Great Britain. Uh, turning now to disability, disability plainly uh, a major reason for leaving the forces can be sort of being just uh, you know invalided out, um, and so and as we heard earlier in the conference that. Uh, Disab the disabled, the dis disabled people experience uh, lower rates of employment in general than uh, people than the able-bodied. So, um, but the same is um, apparent for veterans. Disabled veterans, the whole, are much less likely uh, than non-disabled to be working. There's quite a large differential. So that's uh, over 30, 34 percent, nearly 34 percent difference in the probability of being in, in work. The, the percentage of disabled veterans employed, it also decreases as the, their age increases. Um, but, but then to, until the age of, of 40, um, so uh, yeah, it, it does decrease with age. Um, Female veterans are slightly less likely to be, uh, are slightly more likely to be employed, employed than, than men. Um, and the impact of disability on the probability of being in work is higher for the, the army um, than for the other forces. The sort of work the veterans do, um, the strong uh, gender differential, the the largest uh, the, uh, sec industry sectors for men were manufacturing, transport, and car sections uh, for men were manufacturing, transport, and storage, construction, and public administration, defence. Well, for veterans, female veterans. This was very different. Nearly a third worked in health and social work, uh, followed by public administration, defence, education, and wholesale retail, wholesale and retailing and repair of, of vehicles. So a strong um, turning to occupation, the SOC major groups uh, ranked by by percentage of all veterans. So the largest. The uh, sub major groups are transport and drivers, and that that's the that really refers reflects men. Um, the um, and there's probably employed other ranks, uh, and the other the, the the next largest is corporate managers and directors, who probably tend to employ off officers. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to see the effect of rank on previous rank on employment in the APS because rank isn't captured. Um, the, other, the other large occupations for business and public sector associate professionals and um, elementary administration and service occupations. Uh, for men, skilled men, metal and electrical, electronic trades and science engineering and technical professionals for for women administration 
health and caring personal service and major major sources of occupation. Um, younger veterans are more likely to be in elementary administration and service occupations and skilled metal, electrical, electronic and trades and older veterans much more likely to be as working as transport and drivers or corporate managers and directors occupations. Um, I just wanted to conclude in my talk by, so the, the amount of data on veterans is limited, um, but um, there's a prospect of much better, um, a much greater availability of data because the 21 cents, 2021 census for England and Wales and 2022 census of Scotland both include a question on veteran status. Uh, we'll just move to the next slide to show that. So this is the, the question that Jesse previously served in the armed forces, yes uh, or, or no, uh, and whether it currently or pre previously served in the uh, reserves reserve forces. Um, with the prospect of flexible table build, uh, the, there's a potential to create detailed tables for veterans for small areas um, and for a whole range of, of dimensions available in the census. And there's also the prospect that uh, with the data in the census, the, the longitudinal studies could produce very detailed time, time Date information on transitions over time. Unfortunately, the question is not about not asked in Northern Ireland because the census test this uh, revealed that actually asking that question would uh, uh, represent a serious threat to the viability of the census as a whole because of the level of opposition resistance to the question. So it would only be data with Jake Britton. Um, and the other another problem is that the census does not ask when the veteran left the armed forces, the branch in which they serve, or again, or what, what rank they did. Though so that can they can identify that from occupation question, but you cannot break down the other ranks into uh, uh, into um, you know uh, non commissioned officers and ranks, which you'll see is important. Um, so the ONS does plan, plan to link the uh, census with administrative data, at least in the same way as it did with 2011, to produce more up-to-date and regular data on the labour market. Um, it, sorry, it strikes me, though, that the best way of reproducing regular data on the labour force, on the veterans in the future, is to include, reinstate the, labor, the veteran questions to the annual population, survey or LFS. Um, so you know, just concluding, uh, to, to repeat some of the points I've made, that uh, there's a lack of regular data on veterans. The annual population service for 2014 to 18 has been the only source of detailed information on that for Great Britain on um, veterans, um, and which can be used to monitor the experience of veterans. Um, and uh, in order to look at uh, ongoing trends in veteran employment, uh, the uh, reinstating question to the APS would be one uh, probably the best way of doing uh, one way of doing that. Um, right. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, I think that's, uh, that that concludes my 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 talk. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. It was a really uh, interesting presentation and I appreciate and I, I actually really appreciate that in, in amongst that dilemma of not being much data out there to understand um, this very small or niche part of the population further that the pooled data set, the pooled APS file is being useful uh, for that reason. Okay, thank you very much, David. So um, now we move on to the second presentation of this session, um, which is from Richmond 
Egye from the King's College of London and Economic Stats Research Centre of Excellence. Um, Richmond is the fourth year PhD student in economics at the King's College in London, and he holds an MPhil in economics uh, from the University of Ghana and a Bachelor of Arts degree in the economics from the Kum Nkrumah um, University of Science and Technology. In Ghana, and prior to joining the King's College in London, um, he worked as a principal research assistant at the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research uh, at the University of Ghana. His research interests are in applied microeconomics, focusing on labour economics, um, developed economics and economics in education. He's part of the Economics uh, Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence a Research Network, and his current project involves using administrative data to develop develop new labour force and migration statistics for the United Kingdom. So, um, Richmond, if you're ready, then um, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Okay. I hope you can uh, see my screen. Yes, we can, yeah, thank you. Yes, um, so this, uh, my first work that I did when I started my, uh, with my PhD. So, um, it's a work that we did um, and we, pub um, okay, it's not been published yet. It's, it's, it's still in the, uh, as we've published on, on the ESCO website as a working, uh, as a working document. So um, I'm looking forward to your comments so that I can make it uh, very well and then I publish. Uh, before I start, um, I would like to issue a disclaimer that this work was produced using Stascal data from ONS. The use of the ONS Stascal data uh, does not imply ONS endorsement. So um, this work uses research data sets which may not exactly reproduce national statistics aggregates. All right, so um, basically, um, we know that UK relies heavily on survey data to estimate uh, migration uh, statistics. And um, currently we know that there is no known immigration register in the UK. So much of the assessments uh, are done using the survey data. And basically uh, it's done using more, they rely heavily on the annual population survey or the labor force survey, and then the international uh, passenger survey. And we also know that uh, because survey data set has um, the, the, uh, there's issue with the sampling size, we are not like, there will definitely be a margin of uh, uncertainty. So using that to publish local area population estimates may actually be problematic and uh, it will come with a margin of uncertainty. So what we intend to do we in uh, what we try to do is to explore whether an alternative source of information regarding local area immigration population uh, could help improve the accuracy and the reliability of published uh, local area migration figures for UK. So um, what uh, we propose is to use the electoral roll register. And uh, what we try to do in this paper is to try and compare if we can actually get some information from the electoral roll register that can help us um, uh, estimate uh, migration figures from it. So um, that's what we do. We try to calculate some estimates. We drive some estimates from the um, electoral roll register and then we compare it with its equivalent estimates from APS data and then the census and then we try to compare and then uh, we try to make, uh, we try to conclude that if possible, maybe they can start considering the use of electoral register as a means of uh, publishing uh, migration statistics. Um, before I start, I would like to, um, talk a little bit about the definition because in the electoral register, we don't have a variable that describes where name was born or whether the name was born abroad. But then we have nationality and we know that using UN definition for uh, migration, uh, they use uh, whether you were born abroad, where you were born uh, to be able to estimate that statistic. So that's um, the only caveat. 
Other than that, so for now, for this paper, we use nationality as our definition for uh, immigration. And we know from the APS and census, um, we also can get nationality from there. So what we do is to compare the two. And then um, we make our suggestions. And another issue would also be those with dual uh, nationality, uh, which uh, we note that it could be a problem. But then perhaps if maybe in the electoral roll register, when they are registering, if they can include where you were born, it could really go a long way to help. Um, why are we thinking the electoral roll registration um, register could be important? Because of its uh, legality. That's, they, they, if, you, if you don't register, you could be fined. And then the way and manner in which the local authority tries to update the register, we think it's, it's a good way of capturing everyone into the register. Um, um, for now, we don't have the individual uh, level data sets. So what we use is the aggregate uh, published data on the um, ONS website, uh, that is for the electoral rule. So they publish um, the aggregate for each local authority. So that's what we use. And then for the census, we use the 10% uh, individual level sample and we use the uh, annual population survey from 2004 to 2017. And I've, I've done lots of work after uh, we published this. So for now, I'm not going to talk about those ones. I would limit myself to this. So how do we uh, then capture, um, because for now we don't have the individual, uh, individual level data sets, but then how do we do what we intend to do? Um, we know from uh, the voting that, um, for instance, uh, those from the European Union can vote in the local authority election, but then they cannot vote in parliamentary election. So then, if we um, difference these two, then we know that the difference between those who are in the local authority, uh, those who can vote in the local authority election uh, versus those who cannot vote will represent uh, the European Union. So at least we're able to capture the EU uh, nationals from there. And then we compare it with um, a drive, what a drive estimates from the APS, which we do. And then we compare to see if uh, the APS is able to uh, give something similar. And then we see that uh, when, when you look at uh, the graph, we see that from up to, um, I think 2014, they seem to be moving at the same level, but then after that, it drops. And we, we try to find the reason for why it happened that way. It could be that uh, maybe because there was a change in the way registration was done in the electoral register, that could be the reason. So we tried to see uh, who were those who could have dropped out. Could it be EU students? or not. So what we do is to try and add um, those uh, EU students to return to C. But then still, there was still some gap. So um, our conclusion from that was um, probably they may not only be the reason, the students may not be uh, only the reason. It could also be a reduction in double entries linked to movers. So we were not really clear as to what could be the reason. But then uh, we still uh, went ahead to compare uh, the three uh, data sets. So we started by uh, listing the top 50 uh, local authorities with the highest EU nationals. So we compare across uh, the three data sets. And then what we find is that, um, for instance, so we, uh, we rank them and checking it individually, uh, we're able to see it looks like the electoral roll register moves closely with the census than the APS. All 
All right. Um, yes, and then uh, the other thing that we do is to find the correlation between the two. So we look at the correlation between the electoral register and the APS. We also look at the correlation between the electoral rule and the census and uh, the census and the APS. And yeah, all the uh, correlations seem uh, to be pretty high, but then we we find that uh, the electoral rule register seem to be much closer to the census, obviously, because it's also an administrative data. It's, uh, it was expected. Um, then the next thing that we tried to do was to look at how the distribution have, have done in terms of over time, as in the top 50, whether they account for how much. And uh, we find that, um, so for instance, we find that um, the top 50, uh, the electoral register in 2004 accounted for about 61%, whereas this accounted for about 63%. And then with time, um, this one has been dropping steadily as compared to this. Um, the other thing that we also tried to do was to also look at, for instance, we know that the common characteristics of immigration settlement pattern is the geographical concentration. So we, we were thinking that it could be that, for instance, if there is an influx of uh, EU migrants at a certain point in time, then we expect that um, if we should calculate the geographic uh, inequality, we'll be able to capture uh, at what point in time this inequality was. What I mean is, for instance, um, when people move uh, early, early on, they would definitely try to live close by, or they would try to go to where their people are. So we expect that inequality will be high, but with time, then as they're able to assimilate, then they can uh, spread uh, and then it becomes even. So we start by looking at, um, the 2011 data set because we have the census and then we compare. But then when, when we do the comparison, we find that the electoral roll register uh, has a closer correspondence with the uh, census than the APS, except for, for one. So we also further uh, have the conviction that it could be that if they use the electoral roll register in, in in estimating uh, migration statistics, it could help. The next thing is we try to see um, by looking at the inequality over time. Thus, we didn't have enough data to 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 uh, to justify what we really wanted to say. For instance, um, we were thinking that probably maybe in two thousand and five, as a result of A eight uh, moving to the UK. Uh, it's good capture. And then we find that um, the year, we were thinking that the year perhaps may, may have captured uh, the immigration uh, movements over time better than the APS. The next thing that we tried to do was to, um, still with the differences in the local authority, was to assess. So another way we try to assess the degree of correspondence between the APS and the year count is to estimate a simple regression where the dependent variable is the APS and the uh, count of the EU nationals. And then um, so the main explanatory uh, variable of interest is the equivalent uh, electoral rule register. Count. So if the population counts in the two uh, data sets in area I in time T, okay, are the same, we would expect that the estimated coefficients from a simple uh, two variable regression uh, will be zero on the intercepts and then unity on the slope. But then if there is a negative intercept, then it will suggest that um, APS may underestimate the count of uh, the count in the reference local authority, okay, in the first period. 
So that is what we try to do. And then this is what we find. We find that um, when we do um, the regression without uh, the local, uh, without year dummy and uh, local authority fixed effect, uh, we find that um, we find that the year slope statically is significantly different from one. When we add uh, the local authority dummy, it relaxes the constraints a bit, but it's still different from one. But then, and when we look at, when we add the structural brick to find um, whether maybe the change in register could have helped, then we find that um, adding the post year 2014 structural brick, um, now we see that the year slope is uh, equal to one. Um, the other thing that we tried to do was to look at um, the local authority uh, coefficient. We find that there were a significant number of them which were negative and others were positive. So we wanted to try and uh, understand how um, or what could be the reason for these things. So what we did was to extract these coefficients and then uh, we ran regression on them to try and see if we could find the explanation. And uh, what we did was to, um, what we found was that it could be that the population in uh, those local authority could actually explain uh, some of these stuff. So in conclusion, um, we think that the electoral register appears to offer complementary and useful information on regional figures and trend. And it appears to be very close to uh, the census. That is, if you compare it to the 2011 figures uh, than the others. Regional dispersion uh, pr probably may be better measured through the electoral register than the APS. Yes, even though uh, nationality is not uh, a good way of measuring immigration, but I think we think it's, it's quite close. Um, we think that if we get access to the electoral re register, as in getting the individual level data, uh, we could be able to do a uh, match and then uh, advance our case than uh, we did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richmond. Uh, it's a really good presentation.